Um, my name's Joan Twelves. I'm on the COVID Action Steering Committee. I'm sure many of you know me. Um, and we're really pleased this evening to welcome Stephen Riker, um, Professor Stephen Riker, I should say, who many of us know from watching him on Indie Sage as much as anything else and his other credentials. A couple of housekeeping chores. If you want close captioning you can access it via the cc button at the bottom they can keep changing these buttons um and people have different ones on different um devices but if you can try that somebody seems to have got it going can you use chat and electronic hands if you want to speak as much as possible obviously if you can't find your electronic hand and you want to ask a question later just stick it in chat and we'll pass it on we are recording the call, but we're not live streaming it. I know that concerns some people. It will make it available on our website in a couple of days. We're only showing a view that does the speakers, not the gallery. So if you don't want to be recorded, please let us know in the chat. Keep your video off and you can even change your name if you want. Um, stay on mute unless you're speaking. It cuts down on the background noise and feedback, but Although we recognize there's limited bandwidth for a lot of people and people might not want to, it's really nice if you go on video when you're speaking, if you want to ask a question. It's more friendly and also helps people who are hard of hearing if they can see lips. Um, so not just on video, but <laughs> video so your face can be seen and not just the top of your head, <laughs> um, which is often the case. As I said, we're really pleased to invite Stephen along. I asked him just now um, what what he wants to address and he said well mainly the uncertainty but yes it is isn't it I my sum, stomach sank on when was it Saturday when the news headlines started saying Covid wave in a care home and I felt like that kind of the voice from that woman they use all the time about elections saying oh no not another one kind of feeling of, of you know deja vu yet again we're going back round and round and yet again the government hasn't got a clue what to do they've dismantled everything they could have retained to be able to to fight another wave um and you know the schools are going back everybody's going back indoors well they will be in a couple of days i think when the thunderstorms start the ones we're looking forward to um but they you know they've got to start again suddenly kind of very very limited cohort for for vaccines um no explanation about about why it's really important to keep on getting vaccines instead it's the oh it's all right if you've had covid you're probably immune you don't need a vaccine um and no testing no monitoring no surveillance and uh, no mitigation so you know yes uncertainty but we're pretty certain about what's needed. It's how do we get them to actually do it, I think, is the question. So I'm going to hand over to Stephen, who's got 10 to 15, no, 15 to 20 minutes. But if you, you know, remember your questions, keep them stored up. We'll have a QA and a and a summing up after Stephen's spoken. So as I said, put them in chat if you're not going to remember them. Um, we'll kind of try and get to everybody afterwards. Thank you, Stephen. OK. Hello. I, I have no idea why why Joan invented uh, invited me. She's just given my talk, so <laughs> I could stop at that point, but uh, I won't. Um, it does feel very familiar, doesn't it? The September surge is with us again. Um, news headlines about growing infections, growing hospitalizations. As you say, one is chilled when you hear about outbreaks uh, in care homes. And um, this seems to have been going on year after year after year. And the headlines kind of give the impression it's come back, to which most of us here, I think, probably would respond by saying it never went away. We closed our eyes, and like a toddler who thinks that the world disappears when you close your eyes, we thought that in closing our eyes, in ending the surveillance, in ending... We often use the word world leading and in, in a very mistaken way, but I think it's true to say that some of our systems, uh, some of our surveillance systems, our Office of National Statistics surveys and so on, were genuinely world leading. We knew what was going on. Um, we had an accurate notion 
of where the infection was so we knew where to put our resources in order to stop it but we trashed those we we turned them off and in many ways when you ask the question yes okay we know that something is going on we know that there is a uh, a resurgence but what exactly is going on the honest answer is we genuinely don't know because we don't have those random population surveys which allow us to look at the prevalence in different places amongst different groups and so the data we do have is either uh, people self-selecting or people going to hospital, which is a very particular cohort. And they, yes, they tell us there's a problem, but we don't know exactly what the problem is. And we don't know where the problem is either. And even, and, and this is, at some level, it's Kafkaesque. It's, it's bizarre. It's a nightmarish scenario. The ONS has told us it's going to increase its surveillance. But they haven't told us exactly what they're going to do. So we don't even know what they're going to change in order to get us to know what is going on. When it comes to the um, the new variant itself, the B BA286, the Pirilla, uh version, well, last week the CDC, CDC put out an assessment, which mainly was, we don't know. Uh, it looks as if it probably is slightly more infectious. Um, it's got about 20 or 30 mutations, so it may be able to um, evade our immune systems. It may make the vaccine slightly less effective. Um, will it make, make us sicker? Will it have other side effects? Again, we don't know because the data isn't there yet. So we know we've got a problem. We don't know what the problem is. Uh, it makes life extremely difficult. One of the other issues is why. Why are infections rising? And here I think we confront a problem which has been a problem throughout the pandemic, right from the beginning. When we had local outbreaks in the summer of 2020, and there was a decision to go for local containment strategies, the one glaring question which was never addressed is why are infections rising in particular places? Why are we getting outbreaks in places like Leicester? Now, the obvious answer was to say, well, it's because people are more exposed to the virus. The reason why they're more exposed to the virus is that they have less resources, they're less privileged, they're more vulnerable, they're more marginal, they're poorer, they're more excluded from society. All the groups which tend to live in crowded housing so we're more likely to get infected. All the groups which are likely to work in public-facing jobs or in crowded workplaces, which leads to all the uh, more infection. The groups which are less likely to have private transport, and so they use public transport, and so are more likely to get infected. In other words, infection comes down to systemic issues to inequalities in the environments, the circumstances in which we live. But the government never acknowledged that. Its discourse was always one of individual culpability, individual blame, and individual punishment. So it would talk about covidiots right at the start, talked about covidiots. Now, remember, the thing about covidiots was that people were doing what they were asked to do. They were told, you are allowed to go out once a day for your well-being, for your health. You're allowed to go out. Now, if you're nice and privileged and you have a nice garden and you could sit in the sun in the garden, that's fine. You can go outside and be very comfortable. If you're not, all you can do is go out into the streets and look for the local park. And when you get to the local park, because there are a lot of people and not that many parks, you find yourself crowded in those particular areas. And rather than asking, OK, how can we make more public space available? How can we open up the playing fields? How can we open up the golf courses? How can we make the private public so people can be distanced? How can we deal with those systemic inequalities? The headline screamed, COVIDiots. And government ministers talked about people who were selfish. Uh, and their response 
was then to not only to blame individuals, but to bring in fines up to £10,000 for breaking the rules, a narrative of blame. And again, it seems to me that's what's going on at the moment. The implication is we have rising infections because you and I aren't behaving responsibly. You and I aren't doing the right thing. You and I have got to take personal responsibility. But of course, that misses the point that however much responsibility you take, if you're in an unsafe environment, if you're in a stuffy environment, if you're in a crowded environment, if you're in a noisy environment, then whatever you do, you can't keep safe. That infection has got much less to do with individual behavior and individual misbehavior. And it has to do with the nature of the environments in which we live. And that's never really been addressed. Many of us, right from the start, were arguing, for instance, that if we want to keep schools open, and we all wanted to keep schools open, then you've got to make schools safe. And how do you make schools safe? Well, you ventilate them. You, um, uh, early on, we argued for, for instance, for classes to be held in museums and other public buildings that were closed at the time, so you could have uh, more distanced um, uh, classes, to hire more teachers so you could have smaller classes and so on, that if you had made the environment safe, you could keep the schools open. That was never done, still hasn't been done. If you want to stop infections, then more generally, we have to keep, uh, keep the public spaces which we inhabit safe. So to me, the priority at this stage should be to push that argument forward, to push forward the argument that actually what we're dealing with is not a disease which spreads through um, the ill will of the public. The public is not the problem. And public behavior is not the problem. In many ways, actually, public behavior is the solution. It was public solidarity where we supported each other, which made up for the failures of government. It was local mutual aid groups, and local neighborhood WhatsApp groups where neighbors looked after each other. That was the solution. That was giving support to people who otherwise wouldn't have been able to cope, whether it was simply checking they were okay, whether it was buying food for them, whether it was walking the dog. The state didn't do that. The public did that. The public with a solution were not the problem. The problem has always been the government's refusal to address its culpability and its responsibility to create environments in which we are safe. And first and foremost, of course, the issue of clean air. It seems to me we've got to make the issue of clean air as salient and as important as clean water was in the 19th century. And in fact, it's a very interesting story, which some of you will know, but I think it's worth telling again. An interesting story about how sewers were brought to London. Um, basically, uh, the problem originally was with uh, fertilizers. As fertilizers were, came along, you no longer needed to use human feces um, as fertilizer. And so uh, the human feces were not taken away. They grew in size, they spilt over and they went into the river and the Thames became a stinking morass, causing many, many um, uh, diseases. But Parliament ignored it. Parliament denied it. Parliament wasn't prepared to accept that this was a systemic issue until the great stink, it was called, the great stink of 1847, where it was so hot and the Thames was so low that the levels of human shit outside Parliament caused such uh, a revolting smell that even parliamentarians had to admit that there was a problem only when it came to them only when the ship was piling up on their doorstep did they begin to do something about it. Now, in the same way, we've got to force our government, our parliamentarians, to take seriously the issue of clean air and the issue of uh, ventilation. 
HEPA filters and so on. There need to be very clear rules. Now, to a certain extent, there are already those rules there. There are health and safety laws. There is an obligation to create a safe workspace. And we know a safe workspace includes clean air. There's just one problem. Laws are pointless if we don't enforce them. And when you look at the evisceration of the health and safety uh, inspectorate, it's no surprise that there is uh, no enforcement of those laws. Between 2010 and 2017, the number of local health inspectors, health and safety inspectors, fell by some 50%. And it's probably fallen quite a lot since then. So the people aren't there. Um, the HSE was cut by about £100 million. Money was just taken uh, away from them. Uh, during the pandemic, they gave up completely on spot checks on workplaces. They didn't even try. They did 15-minute telephone interviews. Now, how are you going to find out about malpractice? If you ask people over the phone, are you doing the right thing? Of course, you'll get a cosmetic answer. Of course, it will achieve nothing. In the first year of the pandemic, there was an analysis which showed that the government issued about 120,000 fines. It went after individuals. Again, the individual strategy, blame and punish the individual. 120,000 people were fined. And incidentally, you were three times as likely to be fined if you were black than if you were white. So uh, this wasn't only an individualistic strategy, it was a racist strategy as well. And it affected the poor more than the rich. All the normal prejudices you find. So they were able to take action against individuals. But in that time, in that year, in the time that they fined 125,000 people, there were 78 enforcement notices by the HSC and not one single prosecution. Nobody was prosecuted. Action was taken against not one single organization, company, business. So in the end, you can have all the laws you like, but if you don't have an HSE that functions, which does spot checks, which makes sure that the law is enforced, it's completely meaningless. And I think that failure is as egregious as any of the other failures and needs to be taken just as seriously as those other failures. The failures around PPE, the failures around test and trace, the, the crony contracts that went to Tory MPs' friends, those are appalling. But the failure of the HSE is just as important, and we need to take that seriously. So ventilation we've got to take seriously. The enforcement of legislation we have to take seriously. It's one other thing I think we need to take seriously. If I had to choose one moment that I think is emblematic of the approach of this government during COVID, it would be that moment when Boris Johnson was announcing the end. He called it Freedom, Freedom Day. Everybody talked about Freedom Day as if all COVID measures were restrictions and they took away your freedom. Where, of course, many COVID measures were about supporting people to have the choice to stay at home, were about actually doing things like creating safer environments. They were support, they were protections, and taking them away made people less free, especially vulnerable people who now could not choose to go into those public spaces which were so dangerous to their health. It had nothing to do with freedom. But anyway, Johnson was asked, as he announced, taking away the meager amount of support there was for self-isolation. If you remember, it was a tiny amount of money. And the analysis showed that only one in eight workers was eligible. And only about a third of those who applied actually got any money. So miserable amount of support. But nonetheless, at least it was there. He was taking it away. There was nothing left. So what did you do when you were sick? He was asked how he would advise somebody who was sick with COVID. What should they do? 
And he said, he said, I wish, I'm not going to do a Boris Johnson uh, impersonation, I promise you. He said, I, I wish the British were more like the Germans who have a culture that when they are sick, they stay at home. So it was an issue of culture. It was an issue of choice. The problem with Britain are those foolish people, those covidiots who choose to go to work. What he failed to mention, of course, was that Germany has just about the best sick pay in the OECD, where you get about 100% um, percent of your wage immediately. And I think it's the six weeks in the UK, we have about the worst sick pay in the OECD, where you get 19% of uh, the average wage, uh, and where quite often you don't get it immediately, and so you get nothing uh, to start with. So it's not a matter of people choosing to stay at home. It's the fact that people have no choice but to stay at home. And we know that the absence of sick pay and precarious employment was one of the major factors in outbreaks in care homes, that in those care homes which had poor employment practices, which didn't support people, which didn't pay people at, to stay at home, they were far more likely to have large outbreaks than those who didn't. So directly, the lack of sick pay was part and parcel of what killed so many of our vulnerable old people in those dark days of 2020 and 2021. Now, let me just finish by saying this. We are not in 2020 or 2021. Many things have changed. We have better medicines if you get COVID. We have better management if you get COVID. And above all, of course, we have vaccines. There is a problem, of course, in that the government is all over the place with its vaccine strategy. It's only going to give them to vulnerable people and people over 65, not people over 50. And their argument is it's not cost effective. Now, what's interesting is when they make that statement, when they make that claim, what do they include in the definition of cost? Do they take into account long COVID? Well, they say we're a bit uncertain about long COVID, so we won't take that seriously. So one of the major factors uh, which is affecting our economy in terms of app staff absences, uh, in terms of problems with the workforce, in terms of the load of the NHS, they don't include at all in their cost calculations. And so these are very strange cost calculations at all. So yes, we're going to have a limited program of vaccination. And yes, it's been brought forward a little bit, but it's still inadequate. And it's still in turmoil. So one of our fundamental demands has got to be for adequate vaccination. Even the government overloaded everything into a vaccine-only strategy, and now it's dismantling that vaccine strategy. Perhaps you'll be able to buy vaccines. Perhaps. And if you can, you'll have to afford them. So again, we'll have yet another health inequality. And yet again, it will be the poor and the vulnerable and the marginal who will suffer much, much more. But as well as that, these vaccine strategies, we need a strategy to create a healthy environment and healthy workplaces. We need to demand that all workplaces are adequately uh, ventilated and have clean air. We need to demand that the HSE is properly funded in order to make sure that that is the case. And we need to make absolutely sure that we live in a country where you can afford to stay at home if you are sick. I think in many ways there is something quite disgraceful, quite disgraceful about today's Britain being a country where you cannot afford to be sick and to stay at home. I think it's an indictment, one of the many indictments of this government. And the point about that strategy is yes, it's a strategy for COVID. Yes, it's a strategy to deal with the uncertain things that are going to happen in terms of infections and new variants. But it's also something about building a healthier society that we should do, whether there is COVID or not. It's part and parcel of living in a decent society, in decent environments. And I just want to finish with this. One 
of the positive things about COVID at the beginning is that we responded as a community. For most of us, because most people were not at that great a risk as, long, as far as we knew. We didn't know about long COVID back then. Most of us wore masks, most of us socially distanced, not to keep ourselves safe, but to keep our community safe and to keep the most vulnerable in our community safe. And if you looked at the research, it showed that on the whole, people adhered to COVID measures out of a sense of community, out of a sense of identification with their neighbourhood, with their town, even with the country. They said, we want everyone to come out of this well together. It was about social responsibility. Because if you made it about personal responsibility, then for many people, there wasn't much reason to adhere. The costs of adhering were much greater than the benefits. Only if you made it something communal, something social, something about coming out of it together well, would people adhere. Over time, that's been completely forgotten. The talk of social responsibility has been completely usurped by this empty talk of personal responsibility, where what that means is I'm clear. How do I take personal responsibility for being safe in a dangerous environment? But above all, it has abandoned the vulnerable in our society. Now, according to the figures, there are 3.7 million clinically extremely vulnerable people in the UK. And if you add to that their carers and their families, you're taking about 10 million people. And all the public discourse has forgotten those 10 million people, completely forgotten the situation for them, completely forgotten that as you open up spaces, as you take away protections, you make those spaces actually more prohibited to those people. You create health apartheid in this country. Well, as I say, we've got to create a country in which you can afford to be sick, whether you're rich or poor, and a country in which we attack and reject and do everything we can to make sure we don't have health apartheid, where some can go out and others, in effect, are locked in, those, in their homes. Those were messages which were loud and clear in 2020. And I think the simple truth of 2020 need to be remembered and we need to re-articulate them and we need to make sure that we do take action to create a healthier and a safer and a fairer society. So I'll finish at that point. Thank you very much, Stephen. I definitely didn't steal your speech. Um, I'm waiting for some hands um, while I do. As a post-war child, of the baby boomer generation. I was brought up with a welfare state. And over the last 30, 40 years, we've watched that disintegrate. And I think that's what we need to be arguing again. We need to go back to having what we set up when I was a baby, and which our parents set up from having fought in the war. Then we need to be demanding that that is brought back because that's actually, you know, that's the social justice I was brought up to believe in. And it is a, a tragedy that so many of my own generation prefer to be selfish and not think about others. Although, as Stephen said, an awful lot of them were very unselfish in the early days of, of the pandemic. And we've lost that again as well. I think Partygate did more than anything to destroy that. I'm still waiting to see any electronic hands or waving at me, but I prefer electronic ones. Gary, and then Ian, and then Noah. Um, <clears throat> it appears we seem to be going through the same mistakes all over again. There's no mask wearing. There's no testing. People are just going around doing whatever they please as if it's a normal society, which, of course, we know it isn't. Um, COVID to me is uh, something that is an all year round virus, not just a part year. Um, we're going to have the same problems this winter that we've had previous winters. We're going to have people losing lives. We're going to have people that are debilitated through COVID, disabled, long COVID, etc. Exactly the same again. 
because of this government's intransigence again. Um, my question is to Stephen, um, is he, does he feel that, the, that we are at the point where we're going to have a variant that's going to come along and sort of um, be, go against <clears throat> the variant in such a way that we've got a real problem on our hands? Right, I'm sure Stephen would prefer to collect a few questions and then um, answer them in, in batches of three or four. Ian? Yeah, thanks, John, and thanks, Stephen. Um, presentation, fantastic, as usual. Um, yeah, Stephen's absolutely right. We have had a horrendous time with the health and safety regulator. Not one single authority in Scotland have recorded a rudder um, report to the HSE with over um, 70 absences for long COVID um, being diagnosed within staff working in the, in the NHS, working within local authorities. Um, I was at first quite, um, I, I praised the Scottish government for some of the actions that they took. Um, that were in place longer than the UK government. Let's face it, couldn't have got any worse than Boris Johnson. Um, but I think that one of the fundamental flaws that the UK Parliament made was two weeks before they returned to school in August 2021, 20, they decided that they were going back 100% instead of the 25% that we initially thought and that we were putting mitigating safety measures in for, and that led to a massive um, uh, infection rate within the uh, school community. And of course, that went into the local community. But as we were not, we were always told that there was mitigating safety measures within schools, within the early years, within the community centres. That absolutely never happened. And of course, when you get the situation now that services are being forced back into locality offices in Edinburgh, where they are overpopulated with no CO2 um, uh, monitors in place, with no HIP units in place, um, there's only one direction that that's going to go in at the moment, and that's going to be a continual increase. Um, we were over 100 uh, recorded infections in Edinburgh City Council for last week. And that's the first time that's under reporting because we, I know for a fact that not all the departments are actually recording it. And that's through the instruction of the Scottish Government. Thank you. Thanks, Ian. Amanda, and then I'll ask Stephen if he wants to come back. Um, thank you, um, Stephen. That was, uh, well, always good to hear your uh, trying to take away that or thinking uh, beyond the individual because obviously um, that's all like um, Gary was talking about as we kind of encounter the individual um, on a kind of daily basis as the, uh, uh, if anyone is going out they're always, well, mostly the lone mask wearers. Um, and I, I guess my question is, I work in university, my partner's at, uh, is in schools, and we're, you know, the not quite the lone maskers, but, well, he, he is. And just until we can, I feel like, yeah, maybe until or um, to help with demanding this, we need to get more people on board and, all of, and so I, I guess any tips for I'm always I'm the one in every kind of you know beginning of every term reminding people of the numbers and what they should be doing and suggesting they wear masks and I'm you know I'm continually aware that I'm the you know I've gone from being the fun person who just you know talks about women's inequality or to just basically the COVID person and I uh, just wondered if there's any tips or from you or anybody of how to keep having those conversations with people that, um, I mean, it feels quite exciting to be able to talk to a psychologist, like, so that you're, 
you know, not making them close their ears um, because I just do not understand why I, I don't still don't understand why people have not refused to go to work or refused to send their children to school with the wealth of evidence of how bad this is and how bad it's going to be in a few years. Um, and I, I just don't, I just still can't conceive of it. And yet, you know, every day I'm confronted by people pretending it's 2019. Um, thank you. Right. I've got, I'm collecting questions from the chat, but we'll come to those in a minute. Stephen, do you want to come back at this stage? Okay, so uh, let me remind you, I am a behavioural scientist. I'm not, I'm not a doctor. Um, <laughs> I, in fact, I had a place to study medicine, um, and I turned it down. And when I told my mum, she burst into tears and it, it was convinced for the rest of her life that I'd ruined my life. But um, <laughs> uh, I, 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 there are various things on which I don't feel I have particular expertise. But just a comment on new variants. Remember that mutations are always random. So you can't predict them. Uh, we can't say that a new variant is going to come along. But what you can say is that the more times the virus reproduces, the greater the probability of a mutation. And one reason for getting prevalence down is precisely to lower the number of reproductions and lower the likelihood of um, you know, a catastrophic mutation, which makes this thing more dangerous. There were lots of debates uh, amongst the biologists about in time, does a virus evolve to be uh, less dangerous? But there's no clear evidence about that. I, I, the only point I would say is get prevalence down is yet another reason why you don't ignore infections. That infections are not something we can just ignore and just say, oh, well, it doesn't really matter. Uh, on the one hand, there's long COVID. On the other hand, there is greater probabilities of variants. So if you don't want new variants, drive down the level of infections in all the ways that we've talked about. Second point, the issue of schools. One of the things I think which was very often misunderstood and misrepresented was around uh, the notion of a lockdown. Okay. Now, first of all, I hate the term lockdown um, because it's a rhetoric which is negative and which is punitive. You lock down people who've done something wrong. You lock down people in prison. Right. So it, it, it it's a notion of punishing people who somehow have done something wrong. It fits into this blame notion. And in many ways, what we should be talking about is in areas which have greater prevalence, let us understand why there is later pre uh, greater prevalence and let's give them the support that they need, whether that be support in terms of housing, in terms of transport, in terms of um, greater vaccination or whatever it might be. So let's support people in various ways. Now, it might be that temporarily, because the infection levels are so high, you have to have some restrictions as well. But overall, we shouldn't be talking about a lockdown strategy. We should be talking about tailored um, strategies of supporting people. Um, so I don't like the notion of lockdown, but the other thing that is misunderstood is that lockdown is not a strategy. Lockdown is a response to a situation running out of control. And so what you're trying to do is to stop people interacting as much. But if you simply have lockdown and then you lift it later and you haven't changed anything in the interim, well, of course, the situation doesn't get any better. Then infections will go up again. So the question is, it buys you time. What are you going to do with the time that you've bought? Now, one thing you're going to do, and one of the things the argument that the government made was, we will develop vaccines. And that's certainly an important part of the strategy. But vaccines alone, however important they are, are not enough. You need a vaccine plus strategy, which includes making safer environments. And the thing we didn't do with the schools was make the schools safer. So you have these um, you know, old buildings, as we now know, crumbling old buildings with appalling ventilation. And you take the kids out of them and then you chuck them back into the same crumbling, stuffy old buildings. And of course, you're going to get infections again. So for strategy, and 
schools are a very good example of this. The real question is, what do you do with the time that you have bought? And if you do nothing, then actually the strategy really is not justifiable. Um, and as I say, the great tragedy, I think, is we did not use that time, even though people were making very good arguments about what we should do uh, in the interim. Finally, wearing masks. And this is a psychological question. Uh, and I could talk for a very long time about it. But let me just make one or two short points. Number one, when we think about human behavior, we often think that the critical thing in human behavior is what people think. If I know what you think, I know what you're going to do. Okay, But actually, a lot of the time, people's uh, attitudes and behavior are not matched. Partly because what is nearly as important, often actually more important, isn't what I think, it's what I think that other people think. What's the norm? What's the right thing to do around here? And there's a lot of research saying that if you believe something, but think the norm is against it, you won't do it. And if you don't believe something, but you think the norm is for it, then you will do it. So the question is often one of how do you build norms? Now, you can build norms in two ways. One is just descriptively. You just talk about um, you know, all the people who are doing the right thing. You pipe port the instances of people doing the right thing. Uh, again, this is one of the areas where the government got it wrong. You know, When they said um, things like, nobody's wearing masks, you ought to wear masks, right? What you do there is counterproductive because you create uh, a non-mask wearing norm. People say, well, nobody's wearing masks, why should I? And the second is what's sometimes called injunctive norms. And this is where you draw on a sense of who we are and what our values are to say, this is the sort of thing that we do. So we care about each other. We look after people who are vulnerable. Um, so it no longer becomes a behavior which is due to the fact that you're slightly odd or slightly paranoid because it becomes something which embodies and which exemplifies uh, who we are. So I think the answer to mask wearing is to ask that question of how do you build norms? How do you build norms descriptively? How do you build your norms injunctively? How do you make clear that actually wearing masks is a sign of a decent society, of people who care for each other, of people who want everybody to be included, of a society which you know obeys that Gandhian injunction that we are defined by the way we treat in our most uh, our most vulnerable. And I think those are norms which are quite strong norms, which many people adhere to, especially in schools. And I think with a bit of creativity, I'm not going to say instantly you will have everybody clamoring to wear uh, masks, but it can make a difference. And, and, and the great tragedy of masks is we've allowed them to be politicized by the right as a sign of freedom. You know, the mask is a muzzle. It's about freedom. No, we've got to reappropriate that the mask is actually a symbol and a sign of, of care, of concern, of community. Um, uh, but there's a lot of work to be done. Thank you, Stephen. Um, right, I've got Sally and Michael. I'm just going to, in terms of the questions in the chat, one was kind of rather technical, which is about do the test kits, current test kits work? I mean, <laughs> your guess is as good as ours, I think. And the other one was why does UK HCA refuse to say COVID is airborne? which is, you know, again, is, is that um, behaviour or is that government policy? But I will uh, take Mandy's question and read that out before I take Sally, because I suspect they may be rather linked. Uh, Mandy's question is, what do you think about the people that were removed from the shielding list? Quite a few with respiratory diseases that will not receive a COVID booster this winter, especially as COVID is an airborne virus. Um, I think this is kind of not just an issue around the age issue, but it's actually they've made it so restrictive for, for what their definition of, of being within the cohort that um, is extremely vulnerable. But I'm going to take Sally, then Michael, and then I've got Joseph. <clears throat> Thanks. That's really interesting, Stephen. Thank you very much. Um, I want to talk a little bit about, um, as Joan rightly predicted, um, clinical vulnerability. Um, I think I might slightly disagree with you. I, I mean, not on the, the need for collective action, absolutely not. Um, but I, I would say that um, when the COVID 
arrived, I was working as a chief executive of an organization led by dis disabled people. And it was quite, it was very scary how quickly the rhetoric of, oh, it's not a problem except for the older and, and people with you know, underlying health conditions started to appear in mainstream kind of rhetoric, in, including from leaders and politicians and public health officials. So, um, and certainly the mitigations at a, a, a time in lockdown quite disproportionately adversely affected disabled people um, and certain other groups. So um, uh, the collapse of social care obviously being part of it. Uh, anyway, I did want to say a little bit also about the narrowing of clinical risk. In Scotland, I don't know about elsewhere, initially there were two groups. There were the higher, highest risk group and the higher risk group. So from early days, there was actually quite an understanding that there were people exceptionally you know, clinical risk, but there were masses more who had some underlying risk. Nobody understood the distinction of why they were in one rather than the other. But effectively, the higher risk group got booted out the door and just ignored very early on. And then the highest risk group became the shielding group. So there are out there somewhere a lot of people with predisposed different levels of risk um, that uh, are basically probably don't know about it or have never really been acknowledged, there's never been any policy for it. And then, of course, what happens is that we get um, uh, the increasing narrowing um, of, so like now it's people between, because it's both age and clinical risk, so, so 50 to 60 years can't get the booster. Um, but also people with comorbidities can't get the booster because you don't click a, clin a clinical box like me, <laughs> I don't, you can't get it. Yet comorbidities and multiple is, is widely recognised in all the literature, as far as I can see, as being a huge pre, you know, predisposing issue. Um, so there's there's continuous narrowing down to immunosuppression, and then alongside that, the only understanding of clinical risk being related to your ability to generate antibodies, and that's where you get the vaccine only policy. So I think there's a number of shifts that need to be. Um, instigation i'm really interested in getting your take on how whether these are the right ones and whether how we might do it so um i think there's a shift away from understanding clinical vulnerability in terms of immune response um but also understanding it in terms of tolerance to additional damage because that isn't there um it's about moving away from in related to vaccine only to strategy towards a, uh, an, an individual one, because that's essentially what a lot of that's about, to an environmental one. But it's also very much about a shift away from just to focus on the acute, and so much still is the focus on acute illness and the impact of acute illness and hospitalization because of acute illness and, and so on, and deaths because of acute illness. We've got to shift from that, I think, towards a focus on the longer term consequences to long COVID, because that's where the public health disaster is really, really coming about. Um, and it's not being properly monitored. It never was properly monitored, I suspect, unlike some, you know, the more acute stuff, um, you know, but, but that is the real issue. And it's the workforce and so on and so forth. So how do we get that focus? And alongside that, it's about how do you get an understanding? It isn't just about inequality based on clinical risk. It's about exposure risk. In fact, it isn't even clinical risk now. It is exposure risk, all of it. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so um, and I think finally, um, it, that leads us back to all of us being at risk. It is, again, we've got to really break down this thing of it, it's about individuals, little certain groups, everyone's at risk. And then that leads us back again into the whole prevention thing, because it's prevention that is missing. It's about outbreaks, it's about acute, and to a lesser extent, it needs to be more on what happens as a consequence. So that was my quick sort of run through of some kind of key shifts I think we need to make. Just very interested to get your take on that. Thank you. So. I mean, just a couple of comments on um, 
some of the other things were raised, and then I'll, 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 I will. Well, I won't answer, Sally. I will engage uh, with what you said. I mean, I think that the point that somebody made uh, a bit earlier about just grasping that this is airborne. I mean, it's terribly simple. Um, it, 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 it makes a really important point about how we tell the history of COVID. Because the next pandemic is always framed by the way in which we think about the last pandemic, right? the representation we have to it, the taken for granted assumptions we have in it. And, and you know, there were a whole series of taken for granted assumptions about this one, you know, based on the fact that it was like flu, that were just plain wrong. And we hung on to them. And people hang on to them if they're not explicitly uh, challenged, um, even when they've been debunked time after time after time. So I was looking at the CDC advice um, in the case of the new variant, and it's still saying, wash your hands. Now, washing your hands is a very good idea, right? Please wash your hands. There's, there are these wonderful studies, actually horrible studies they do, um, of the percentage of people who who have got urine on their fingers when they shake your hand and there's a map of the uk showing sort of the percentage in different places it goes up to about 60 or 70 percent although these studies which show that when they used to be bar snacks on the whole they had 17 different types of urine on them wash your hands right i'm not against washing your hands it's an incredibly good idea it's not going to deal with COVID. And yet still, these things endure. And I think I, I think it is really difficult to root them out. These ideas which hang on, even against all the evidence, because they fit with a kind of image. So the way we tell the history of this pandemic is going to be absolutely critical for the, for the next one, including you know, the mistakes that were made. So at the moment, um, you know, various people say are trying to argue that the real harm was in our response to COVID, not in our lack of response to COVID and from COVID itself. And so telling those histories is absolutely critical. Now, one of the issues it's going to raise is how do we think about health more generally? Um, and I, I think that's going to be an issue of you know, indescribable um, important. So once a few years ago, you know, the, the people are starting to talk about social prescribing, recognizing that health, both physical and mental, is uh, to do with our conditions of being, our social worlds, our social lives, our connection to others. And they vaunted the fact they were putting quite a few million pounds into social prescribing. Well, I calculated that if you spend at the same rate for social prescribing and everything else, then you would run out of your social prescribing money at about 15 minutes past midnight on the 1st of January. We genuflect towards these things, but we do not really take them that seriously. And a number of years ago, uh, here at St Andrews, we were setting up a new medical school, and we were having a discussion about what we should we prioritise. Right? We had these eminent deans of the big medical schools um, uh, in London, characters who looked like something out of Carry On Doctor, with sort of tweeds and big beards, and and we had three groups. And I started off from the uh, from the social and environmental group, making the point that actually the greatest changes in health have been very simple things, um, like having a sewage system, right? That did more for health than nearly all the medicines you can think of. And one of the biggest changes would be a behavioral change, people stopping smoking. That's what really mattered. And you could see these guys fidgeting because it didn't give them status didn't make them the elect. And then we went on to the people who were talking about the use of optometry to do uh, um, basically being able to instead of using x-rays, use uh, uh, um, use light in order to image bodies to know what to do. And they loved that because it was high tech, it gave them status, it was important. And one of the problems very often in institutions is they like the things that seem very fancy because they turn them into an elect priesthood. They don't like the simple things and the obvious things that we should be doing right. So I think many of the points that you make 
about rethinking medicine and rethinking priorities in medicine and rethinking how we define vulnerability and what we do about it are immensely important things which are immensely important on a whole series of levels and to address them we've got to look at the institutions we've got to look at the pharmaceutical industry and its money and its interests and a whole host of other things besides but if we don't address the questions that you're talking about we will get it as egregiously wrong next time if i could just add one thing i think we should take far more seriously and which i don't think we took seriously enough this time i think one of the greatest mistakes we made was to talk about social distancing okay now the paradox of the pandemic, one of the things that made it so difficult is we wanted physical distancing because physical proximity spreads the infection and can kill people. You don't want social distancing because you want people to keep socially connected because if they're socially disconnected, it's a lot of evidence to show it's bad not only for their mental but their physical health. But the fact that we talked about everything as social distancing meant we didn't ask that question of how do we keep people physically distanced but socially connected? What do we do to allow that to happen? How, for instance, do we ensure there's universal connectivity? How do we make sure that all children have got you know, uh, computer hardware and software that they can study at home? What are the various ways we can bring people together? Connectedness being absolutely critical and something which goes all the way from public transport because the cutting of bus services in rural areas does terrible things uh, to mental and physical uh, health um, through a whole series of other issues. So I think rethinking health is in many ways the big question that's going to come out of the pandemic. So you raise some really interesting and important points, and I very much hope it will be part of that debate. Right, I've got a couple more hands. Um... I must say the whole language of the pandemic is worth a, a, a large analysis, isn't it? Even if it's just on the idea of a Facebook meme going around of what each of those terms mean in reality. Uh, I've got Michael and then I've got Joseph. Hello. I believe that about 80% of the deaths could have been avoided if the government had done things different. The first thing is, if they had done a proper risk assessment and HSE, sorry, they are employers, they should have done a risk assessment. Now, to do a risk assessment, they have to look at the property of COVID. If they had done a proper assessment, they'd have raised that it's a particle. Then, if they'd got research the size of it, you'd have found it is in microns. I think 0.05, something like microns. Surgical mass and other mass are totally useless for putting out this size particle. If they had used a P3 mass, the, would, uh, we could have saved, I reckon, about 80% of the deaths. We could also, no need for lockdown. But if you look at Cambridge University report in 2021, they found that uh, at uh, the Anbrook Hospital that uh, P3 mass when the subject was about 100% effective against COVID. So why didn't the government let people wear proper masks? Now, to make matters worse, in 2022, I came across two articles on the government's website. It's a Middle East respiratory symptom, MERS-CoV, the, the early version of SARS. If you look on there, actually, it might be idea if you go on the ghost website and look at it. It does say to um, to be warned by all persons entering room where suspected, possible, presumptive, or confirmed case is being cared for. A bit further down, with the mass uh, FFP3 respirator conforming to EN149 2001 must be worn by all personnel in the room. If this was known about the previous version, why wasn't it said about COVID? Because that was published by Public Health England in 2016. They are the perfect mask, which was also confirmed by Cambridge University Society in 2021. Now, if you go a bit further and look at the government website, you'll find this. There you can see it. It is a mere COVID close contact algorithm. Now, if they'd use that, 
uh, particularly hospitals, care homes, things like that, they could have prevented a lot of disease. Also, at the beginning of COVID, in March, uh, on the 10th of March, I had a gallbladder operation. I'm in my 70s. I went out shopping on the 21st. I was wearing a P3 mask. Now, I'll sh this is the, the mask. It is actually modified now, but in addition, but I realized then at that time that mask was only protecting me. It's a P3 mask, which uh, Cambridge University found was about 120 effect against COVID on their report. That's uh, scientific, ev scientific evidence. At the time, it only filtered my air breathing, which meant if I had COVID, I would still spread it. But it, it I could safely work on a COVID ward in March, a fit that I was wearing in March. But I didn't realize if uh, someone had COVID, it would spread it. So I took filters in July 2020, I took filters off another mass efficient one and put them on the output one. So if a, a person had COVID, it would also filter out the, the infection from it. Now I sent that information to MPs, ministers, and Boyce Johnson in beginning of uh, August. 2020. I have not had any follow up to it. I have sent loads of information to many MPs. Uh, Boyce Johnson, in Boyce Johnson, I sent him a memory stick in 2021, I think it was, of all the emails that I've sent previously to MPs and ministers. Uh, I also had a, a confirmation that it's been delivered. They never followed it up. I, I've sent to, I've got records of what I, of, of my emails I've sent to many MPs and ministers, including Boris Johnson, and Keir Starmer, etc. I also sent them to, to some of the Labour ones, in Keir Starmer, etc. And no one has bothered to follow it up. Now, that mask, the, anyone in care room wearing that mask, they could have visited their relatives safely. Because all the, the breathing went through a P3 filter, all the breathing out on the separate P3 filter. So all this could have been prevented. This government had information on its own website before the thing, and it recommended masks, which are probably less than 10% effective. They could have saved most of the deaths and need to be in lockdowns if people were masks. If there was a safe outbreak, everyone could, for four weeks, if they wore this mask out of their home for four weeks, then it was, because no one's spreading it, no one catching it, it could be brought under control in four weeks. Now, the thing is, this will also work about any COVID variant of that size particle. It will work, also work against any other uh, uh, aer aerosol infection of that size. And uh, COVID can be a very small particle. Right. Thank you, Michael. So why... Interesting. As somebody said, you need to make sure that the inquiry knows about that. Oh, they have had a memory stink sent for them, and I hope all the information comes out. Right. So they have a memory stink, and it is a very big memory stick on it. I think it's about 400 different piles on it. All right, thanks. So I'm going to take Joseph it, down. There is all the uh, emails sent to MPs, ministers, including Boris Johnson, and there have been uh, proofs that some have been received. There is a lot of information that should come out in the COVID inquiry, and this government is responsible for a lot of unnecessary deaths, a lot of lockdown. Let's see, they are still responsible now for all the money we ought to pay back, they, and so on like that. The need to be in all, all this stuff because people wearing masks are totally useless. Right. Thank and you very much, Michael. Huh? Thank you very much. I'm going to take Joseph now. Right. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Joseph. All right. Um, thank you for your contribution, Stephen. Um, I just wanted to point out, first of all, some breaking news from the Sato labs. I think they must be in Japan. And they're saying that the Pirola um, variant has 120 mutations and possibly will be able to evade all vaccine immunity. Um, so that suggests it's more serious um, than we thought. Now, I did attend independent sage last friday um and they were advising there that although you know the uk i mean this is another area of incompetence even though the uk is not going to have as good a quality vaccine as the us for example that people do need to take the booster when it's offered 
uh, but uh, you know I will be one of those but there's a big question mark there but I also wanted to address the ideological aspect of all of this which is that in my opinion we actually have an anti-vaxxer government <clears throat> and I know people like Andrew Bridgen on the extreme right of the Tory party were expelled for expressing their anti-vaxxer views and so on but it is interesting that both the UK and Sweden uh, and Sweden has become the darling of the anti-vaxxers and the far right including the Daily Telegraph and Jeremy Hunt because of their let it rip doctrine uh, which now continues in that Sweden doesn't even allow paramedics to wear masks they insist instead that they wear um, aprons for droplets again this is you know the out outdated theory of the droplets now one of the villains of the piece in my opinion here is the UK HSA led by that awful person Jenny Harris who I think you know if there are Nuremberg trials at the end of this she should be one of the people in the dock um because they're they're saying they're still downplaying this in the latest incident today their chief medical advisor is was when asked about all the people who are not going to get access to any vaccine said uh well they won't they'll be okay because if they get the new variant it'll boost their immunity i mean this is deliberate misinformation which continues to be peddled by people like the uk hsa and you know again i wonder about the links with the anti-vaxxer elements in the tory party we know that sunak for example invited people into 10 Downing Street to dissuade Johnson from having the pre-Christmas lockdown. We noticed that Howie had links with the people who didn't want any controls in schools and so on. I think there's a very big ideological political issue here. Thanks, Joseph. You stopped suddenly. <laughs> um anyone else before i ask stephen to finally sum up it's um five past seven so I'm sure those who haven't had their tea are desperate to go and get it um right nobody else all right stephen do you want to do a quick summing up you're muted i should know better shouldn't i um same as me <laughs> uh, so let me respond very quickly to some of those points Britain closed down on 23rd of March, or at least when I say closed down, I, I should be careful with my language, but we began to take action on 23rd of March, two weeks later than Italy. Now, there have been modelling studies, and modelling studies give you a ballpark. Let's not take them too seriously, but nonetheless, it's been estimated that had we taken action a week earlier, we would have reduced infections by over 70 percent and saved over 30,000 lives and had we taken action at the same time as Italy uh, two weeks earlier then we would have redu uh, reduced um, infections by 90 percent uh, and over 40,000. So I absolutely agree with the premise that many many people died unnecessarily and due to a series of issues and I think we should be careful when we talk about something as complex as COVID of trying to put it all down to one factor. There were multiple factors going on. One of the reasons for that delay, for instance, was, again, it's ideology. It's a paternalist ideology. It was the assumption about behavioral fatigue, that people are the problem, that people won't be able to cope with it. Remember behavioral fatigue? And what happened was the opposite of behavioral fatigue. People showed incredible resilience but government could not get its head around the fact that the public are not the problem, they are the solution. If they didn't do the right thing, if they didn't stay at home, very often it was for material reasons, it was nothing to do with ill will. So an early study showed that poor people and ethnic minorities were between three and six times more likely to break curfew. Their motivation to do so was exactly the same, it's just they couldn't put food on the table and stay at home. And when Matt Hancock was asked by a parliamentary inquiry why the government never gave people the support they needed to stay at home when sick, 
he said, oh, because they felt that people would game the system. Now, the Tories did quite a lot of gaming of the system when it came to contracts, but and they projected what they might have done on the public. They distrusted the public. So I think there is a behavioural dimension. There is, of course, uh, and I quite agree, the issue about masks is... Well, it's it's harder to comprehend now than it was in 2020. Quite to be fair, um, yes, there is some evidence from before, but the studies weren't that clear. They became clearer. And I would argue, number again, let's be careful of making the perfect the enemy of the good. That all masks make some difference because, yes, the virus is tiny, but it's, it's, it's um, uh, always part of a, a larger particle which on the whole is too big to get through a lot of masks so poor masks are poor but they're not useless but i do completely agree with the message which says wear a mask but wear one that is close fitting and wear one that is effective absolutely true and there's something quite bizarre nowadays in a lot of hospitals where you come in with your high grade mask and they take it off you and they give you a low grade mask and say you've got to have one of ours so the issue of masks, I think, is is an important one. But important as it is, I think we just need to be a bit careful of overstating our case and dealing with um, with uh, simple binaries. And again, I come back to the fact that when it comes to ideology, I think there were a number of aspects of ideology which made the response far worse. I think the first aspect was, as I say, a paternalism, which didn't trust the public, which didn't engage the public, which sought to blame and to punish the public, the public rather than uh, engage us and support us. And I think that was very clearly articulated uh, by Matt Hancock. I think there is uh, a neoliberalism, which believes that you know the individual is always best you know, it's the there is no such thing of society type of ideology, which uh, wants to make things personal um, rather than um, systemic. I mean, that, again, was a critical part, I think, of the ideology. And the third part of the ideology is the notion that the private sector is always better than the public. One of the reasons why we did so badly is because we have such a poor test and trace system. And one of the reasons we had a poor test and trace system is we privatized it. So instead of people you knew and trusted coming to you and asking for your contacts, you got a phone call from some call center miles away and was asked to give intimate details about all your relationships. Of course, it didn't work. So I think there were a whole series of aspects of ideology which are at the core of these failures. Now, it raises a question that, OK, perhaps it's not particularly surprising that the Tories did what they did. Um, we're going to have a general election next year. And the question in my mind is, well, is Labour going to take these things seriously? Is Labour going to take seriously the issue of inequalities? Is it going to deal with these issues of health? And I think in a non-party political uh, uh, basis, we should be putting those questions as key questions for the future. What sort of health service? What sort of health system? How much stress are you going to lay on public health? How much are you going to make sure that people work and live in safe environments? I think we've got to put that on the agenda and argue it as loudly as possible uh, and try and have some sort of influence uh, perhaps on the next government. Thank you very much, Stephen. I think we all would like to have some influence on the next government <laughs> on a whole range of things. <laughs> it, it's the, the the work of the next year if we can't get a general election sooner than that. Um, right. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming. That was a, an excellent session and very well attended. I'm not sure what our next um, speaker is going to be. We haven't made a decision, I don't think. I think we were trying to get somebody. It clashes with, um, we're conscious it clashes with Labour Party conference, which would be interesting, which is much later this year than usual. Um, so I would thank Stephen very, very much for, for a fascinating um, discussion and thank everybody for coming. We had over 60 people here at one point. So I will see you all again soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.
Bye.